Hello again, this is UML Operator. I have used this black diagram in many of our demonstrations. These are class elements rep to represent this e-commerce block model. We've also using the exact same class elements to expand them and expose attributes, operations, receptions, and requirements. And you can expose more, but that's the uh, objective of this particular block diagram. Using the exact same class elements, we have exposed them out in using custom drawing style so that we can use the same model of complexity for simplified views and reporting and customer presentations. In this session, we're going to move from class elements to component elements, component diagrams to represent the exact same ecosystem and implementation, but for different reasons. We will touch on and get to a high level understanding of UML component diagrams and modeling. Most importantly, we will learn when and why to use component diagrams. Component diagrams are useful for visualizing the structural organization and dependencies of components in a system. Identifying the relationships and interaction between different components is critical to a component diagram. Managing and documenting the architecture of complex systems and supporting component-based development and design. So in this case, we have a component diagram and component toolbox. Let's start with what a component is. So a component is a modular part of a system whose behavior is defined by its provided and required interfaces. So provided and required exposed interfaces. Important thing to understand, even if you don't see the class elements, is that a component can be composed of multiple classes or components placed together. A component represents a modular or self-contained unit of software or hardware that encapsulates certain functionalities. It can be the so a software module, a library, an executable, could be a hardware component, or any other tangible part of the system. Components are represented by or as rectangles with a component name inside. Next, I want to talk about interface. So interface in the toolbox is this element right here. You drag an interface in, you give it a name and you define it. In this an example, I brought in an interface, which I call iUser. And in this, I have two operations. There's some important things to note when you're talking about interfaces within a component diagram. Number one, an interface is a specification of behavior and it cannot be instantiated. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Interface is a kind of classifier. So in this particular case, I've classified this interface as iUser. And then when you get into required and provided interfaces, and we'll talk about this in a moment, we have a lollipop here, which is a provided interface called iUser. So this is how this interface may be exposed from a component. And this component happens to be called personalization and is stereotyped as a service specification. All right. So that that's all I'm going to say on interface, but it's kind of important that you understand what this little element is when you bring it in and what it represents as an element in your architecture. Because there's a lot of confusion between how to use or represent interface in a component diagram versus exposing provider or required interfaces using this particular tool, I put together a very quick code example. So in this particular case, we have an interface that is called shape. And if you were to look at the code behind it, you can see it's an interface called shape and it has two operations, two methods, if you will, All right? So we're gonna go ahead and close the code example. And it is being realized through a class element called rectangle and one called circle. So if we look at the code for rectangle, very simple Java code, we're gonna implement the interface, class element, 
implements shape at the interface, right? So the class is a rectangle, implements the interface, right? Same thing with circle. If we go to circle and we look at the Java code example class, circle implements shape, implements the interface. So we're going to close this. So in a model, this is how you'd represent interface in a class diagram. You can see the same tool example that you would if you're in a component diagram, same tool. Here's a class, inheritance. You're looking at a code example. Here's the uh, interface, and then you have the class, right? So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time, probably too much time, when I'm talking about components versus class elements versus interfaces. So this is how you would bring it together uh, through or in a component diagram. So whether you're looking at this particular representation of an interface or this code example, implementation of an interface, an interface represents a set of operations or services provided by a component. It defines how other components can interact with a component. Interfaces are depicted as labeled circles attached to a component right? But I would look at the lollipop as a labeled circle attached to a component and read it that way from the UML specification. Next, I want to talk about dependencies. So a dependency relationship indicates that one component relies on another component. It represents a directional relationship between two components or more, showing that one component is dependent on the other component. One of the powerful features within Sparks Enterprise Architect, I can select a component, and if I have traceability turned on, and mine shows up in the lower right here, and I've shown you how to get to the traceability window, you can see that user interface depends on business logic using this as a dependency. And the reason I want to talk about this is when you're looking at the toolbox, you don't see dependency here. However, if you're drawing a line or association or dependency between elements, I'm going to go ahead and let go. You allowed to use these various line types. Dependency is one of them. So I'm talking about dependency in this. And if you were to go down in common relationships, you would see that you had other relationships that are available to you when you're telling your story and you're talking about your components within your component diagram. So moving from dependency to associations, we see the use of association similar to dependencies between components. An association represents a bidirectional relationship between two components. It specifies that two components are related, but are not necessarily dependent on each other. So in this component model, we have a user interface that has a login association with a user authentication component. So it uses this association with the UAC or user authentication for a login. Now it's not necessary that you do this, but for this example, I wanted to show you, as I spoke about earlier, that a component can have one to many class elements or components inside of it. So this represents a user interface. This represents user authentication component, which could be have multiple class elements, code, components within it. So the whole reason for using this is so that you don't necessarily need to have or represented the class elements or things, modules, other components that are underneath a component that you're talking about exposed. So we can have a conversation between the user interface and the user authentication uh, component. Same thing applies for the account management component, the transaction processing component, and the database. So you can, may have multiple components or class elements underneath these components that you can expose in composite diagrams or other diagrams. So I just wanted to include this element here as an example for this particular association 
component diagram. Now we're going to get into the fun part, and that's required and provided interfaces. All right, so I'm going to start with required interfaces. So I have a user interface component here that has two required interfaces for that represents this audio video player system. So the first required interface is for the audio player to do playback using this provided interface from the audio playback component. Same thing with a video player. This is a required, it's a socket. This is known as a lollipop or ball and ball and socket. You'll hear that often for the video player to do playback, video playback. So this particular component diagram, you can see that this is the provided interface that's expected by the required interface in the user interface for this particular model. Next, we're going to talk about provided interface, which is the lollipop or the ball connected to the component, as we spoke about earlier. So in this particular case, all we're doing is exposing the components and their provided interfaces. So how do you model these or draw these? I'm going to go back to the component diagram we spoke about in the beginning. And you can see we have a provided and we have a required interface. Let me go ahead and delete these, right? And we're going to draw them again. So over in the toolbox, you see exposed interface. We're going to drag and drop that onto our component. And by default, it starts out as a provided interface. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on it. And you can see the type by default is provided. And you can give it any name you want, right? I'm just going to call it provided. Right, and give it any name you want. We're going to drag and drop another one on anywhere and move it wherever you wanted. And we're going to double click on it. This time we're going to change it to a required type interface. And we're just going to call it required. And we're going to hit OK. So that's how simple it is to model those on a component. Now, typically you would expose these interfaces via a port when you're modeling. And I'll show you this in a moment. I'll go ahead and delete this, put a port here. Let's bring another one over. We're going to drag, we're going to drag and drop it right on the port. And then we can come up here, call it required or provided, and then give it whatever name we want, right? So normally that's how you would depict, but it's not mandatory, right? It's assumed that the interface is being exposed by some technology or architecture means of exposing this uh, port, this interface rather. And usually we assume it's a, by a port. But the, when you're putting a port element in here, it allows you to put more definition. If I go ahead and double click on it, see I get all the power of Sparks database to be able to find what this port is, put a lot more intelligence under this particular element within my model. So let's recap. In the beginning of the video, we showed you this class block diagram for an e-commerce ecosystem. And let's say we want to explain or expose this particular class element. So I've created a composite When you double click it. We go into the component for the e-com web platform and inside of it has multiple components, certainly not all inclusive, but we want to expose these components within a component diagram. So we may end up with a model that looks something like this. And that's, these are just the requirements of this explaining component diagram. Where we're going to talk about each one of them. So we talked about the importance of why to use a component diagram. And number one is for system understanding. So the component diagram provides an overview of the system's components. And this makes it a lot easier and helps the stakeholders all stakeholders, technical and non-technical, to, to gain a clear understanding of the, the software or system architecture. The second reason is for component-based development. This helps in facilitating design and integration, especially in complex architectures or systems. So this is the second reason. 
One of the most important features to me of component diagramming is to build on modularity and reusability, especially when you're moving away from monolithic architecture or you're integrating monolithic architecture with service-oriented architecture styles like microservices and cloud implementation. So this is another reason why you want to have your reusable components out there so that you can bring them into your architecture discussions and help with delivery and deployment. And going along with that last feature is component diagrams best expose interoperability. And I highlighted down here this most useful in understanding and transforming monolithic architectures. The next feature of component diagrams is its support for testing and debugging. And testers, test planners, testing architects, etc., tell me all the time that they primarily like using component diagrams to understand, especially in large systems, areas that require more testing due to their criticality and overall uh, system uh, roles and responsibilities. So this is a very important feature of component diagrams as well. Because we're breaking down our architecture into components, this is best for version control and maintenance. So this helps developers and others locate and modify specific components without affecting the entire system. So you're able to keep your components separate, focus on the components during build, test, bug fix, et cetera, when you're dealing with version control and maintenance. So another important feature. A big advantage of using component diagrams is for deployment planning. You're de dealing with specific components and putting them together. This helps developers plan the deployment of components for or around specific hardware and software platforms. This is mission critical when you're talking about continuous integration, continuous deployment in cloud implementations. The next feature and advantage of component diagrams is for communication. And you've heard me talk about DDD or domain driven design or development. A, coming around a ubiquitous language or creating a common visual language is critical across all the stakeholders. So this is another feature of component diagrams within your architecture design and implementations. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about software documentation. And there, another important aspect of component diagrams versus other types of diagrams, which we'll be getting into. And I promised you reporting a video shortly. Uh, hopefully I get to that very soon. But remember when we were looking at this, using the association in this component model, we're able to build reports very quickly, change those on the fly about our component and the whatever the connectors are, in this case, associations, defining what those associations are and how a particular model or system uh, may work. So you can very quickly produce documentation and reporting that supports your delivery in an iterative manner. So you fix something, change something, version of report out to the masses, either via web or via you know, some sort of document management system. So we will talk more about that later as we progress on this channel. So I hope this video was helpful. Please leave a like down below in comments, good or bad, and let me know what you learned or what you want to learn that wasn't exposed today in this video. We'll be covering other diagram types as we're moving forward, but I wanted to cover component diagrams today. I've been talking a lot on using class diagrams before we start moving into use case diagrams and other diagram types. So we covered a great deal. I hope it was helpful for you. Talk to y'all later. Happy modeling.